I can I invite all the uh, uh, presenters to come on stage. Uh, let me start uh, the session. First of all, great to see you all here. Um, my, let me introduce myself. My name is Gargana Petrova. I work at RIPE NCC, uh, which is the regional internet registry for Europe, Middle East, and parts of Central Asia. We distribute um, numbers, so that's IP addresses or autonomous system numbers um, for, for our service region. Um, so we have a very interesting technical session for you. We're going to share um, technical developments that are happening in Southeast Europe um, and beyond. Uh, we have uh, panelists that come from uh, TLDs, uh, co um, country code um, uh, uh, top level domains, yes. Uh, we have uh, panelists from IXPs, Internet Exchange Points, um, and we have uh, panelists from uh, international and regional uh, organizations that uh, distribute um, numbers but also names. Um, and uh, finally, we have um, uh, a panelist who uh, has helped with uh, the founding of uh, NOGS, uh, Network Operators Groups. So, um, yeah, we have a very packed agenda, um, and what I would uh, want to ask you is um, to think of any questions that you might have uh, for the presenters, and uh, I would, I'm really hoping to create a good interaction between the audience and the presenters uh, in order to um, yeah, increase the debate on technical issues. So with this, I'd like to invite uh, the first presenter, Michael. Is it? It works. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Mikhail Anisimov. I'm from uh, Russian Registry.ru Coordination Center. That is the registry for top-level domain of Russia. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, how regulation affects the technical technical actors, technical community, and all technical process in the internet. Uh, my presentation is uploaded, and can I have a clicker? Can I have a clicker? Um, I think the technical desk is going to provide one. Okay, I, I can just, just say next slide if it's more convenient. Uh, please get back to the very beginning. Okay, uh, so uh, oh, the clicker is here. Thank you so much, Serena. Thank you. Uh, let's start with a quick uh, view back, uh, just from the very beginning of the global internet. There were always been uh, some parts who defined how the internet looks like. Uh, the first one was scientists at the very beginning of the internet. I think you remember all the experiments uh, with uh, transferring data from one point to another and the only goal they were looking for is just to find out whether it will work or not. The next were military who tried to uh, build the network who will, who will um, just survive the nuclear strike and anything. They just wanted to make a, a network that uh, will be usable in case of any um, external impact. The next were businessmen and entrepreneurs. Uh, they were trying to make the network as more e economically efficient as it possible. And now we are coming to the new era where the um, shape of the internet infrastructure is defined by regulatory. So uh, I will explain a little bit more of what I mean by that. The first, uh, the first one is uh, online content blocking. This actually the invention of uh, past I should say past five or six years before that this question was not raised so high. But after um, most of the government in the world came to, um, came to the thought that online content should be blocked in any way. In, I, I should say that this problem is faced by almost any government in, uh, in every country of the world. 
uh, there were some inventions that defined how the internet infrastructure is built today. Uh, here on the slide you can see just a piece of the report made by ISOC last year. Uh, they made a really great research and I definitely recommend you to read it through uh, because they described all the ways that uh, governments all over the world and non-governmental organizations actually uh, fight with online content. Uh, and uh, we should keep in mind that it affects very different parts of the internet infrastructure. For example, they described um, the DNS blocking and IP blocking and URL blocking and some other ways, for example, excluding uh, the links from the search engine's results. Uh, that is why that uh, if we are, for example, bidding new provider, we should keep in mind that it should have the ability to block content on the DNS level or on IP level. And it uh, rises in new costs and it rises the new architecture and uh, we should uh, we should think about it before building the provider. That's how the uh, online content blocking affects the technical actors. Another one is personal data protection. Of course, we all heard about GDPR, and the G GDPR is the not the only law that affects that. For example, in Russia, we have pretty similar law about the data protection. It was. Uh, uh, it was invented about three years before GDPR, but it's quite similar. And uh, now a lot of services, a lot of different online products uh, have, to, uh, have to deal with it. For example, now uh, if you're providing Wi-Fi in the restaurant or in the cafe or in the hotel, uh, you cannot just ask people to uh, put in their personal data, their passport, their ID, and other other data. And uh, it leads to creating uh, some uh, third-party authorization providers uh, that we trust and who can do it for us. That's another element of infrastructure that was created uh, with the new regulatory inventions. And uh, here you can see the uh, different different technical things that are affected by this uh, by this regulatory move, like Wi-Fi authentication, personal data storage. For example, in Russia, every company that uh, keeps the personal data uh, should be examined in a special way and to pass through some procedures to prove that they can store all personal data in a proper way. Uh, in other case, uh, they won't be allowed to collect all the data. And of course, we know that uh, domain who is is the most one of the most typical problem, especially for registrars and registries. For example, most of the new GTLDs uh, now do not show the personal data of registrants. And uh, only a few years ago, you could easily find the information about the domain name owners. Now you can't. Another one, very bold move uh, that is uh, discussed highly, especially in Russia and China and some other countries, is so-called so digital sovereignty. This is just a few points from a uh, new Russian law about digital sovereignty or about auto so-called autonomous internet. I will not read it through. You can fi easily find it in my presentation or in uh, almost every source uh, about that. But I should say that it's um, this law is a leader uh, about uh, how much interpretation it's got. We had a lot of publications, especially in Western media, and not, not only in the Western, of course, and in Russian media also, who tried to figure out what it is. And uh, there was some panic titles like Russia is going to uh, unplug itself from the global internet, and so on and so on. But I should, not, I, I should say that, of course, it's not. Uh, but this regulatory move uh, affects the internet infrastructure and technical actors in a very 
uh, prominent way. And that's, oh, that's what really consequences are. For example, uh, before that law, we had some awkward situation in Russia. For example, two major internet providers like Cross Telecom and Trans Telecom uh, had no peer connection between them inside Russia. They exchanged the traffic between them uh, through London, through London Internet Exchange Point. And we had a situation, a Russia, a Russia is a pretty large country, and we had a situation when the traffic from, for example, from Moscow to Vladivostok, that's on the other parts of Russia, in Asian part of Russia, uh, went through the Chinese network. And in case of any damage of the network, or in case of any external impact, there will be no connection between two parts of one country. So uh, this law, uh, one of the goal of this law was to force the operators to make the peer connections within countries. So traffic from one point in Russia to another point in Russia should stay in Russia and should not go abroad. abroad. Another consequence that uh, there were additional mirrors of fruit DNS servers within the country. Uh, you know, before that, most of the DNS requests went abroad uh, just to get a resolving for the main names. And we all know that um, in other countries, it can cause some inconveniences. For example, we all know that just about five or six years ago in Sri Lanka, when the trawler just broke the only cable that connects the island with the continent, uh, it was the end of Sri Lankan internet for several days because they were not root DNS on the island. That is why not any domain names of Sri Lankan TLD uh, could not be resolved, actually. That is why the one of the goal of new law, of new regulatory initi initiative, was to establish as much root servers inside Russia as it possible to make all the requests from the inside uh, to be resolved within the country. And Another one move is, um, another one consequences, I should say, is creating the certification authorities for TLS and invention of new types of crypto cryptography, so-called so ghosts. This, uh, this is, I should say that this is the only um, uh, type of cryptography that should be uh, appealed for internal and governmental purposes within Russia. This also some kind of you know, security move, uh, because in case of any external uh, uh, um, certification center will not be able to reach, it means that most of the websites that uses TLS will not be able to reach also. But I should say that uh, this is not the only way to uh, to describe how regulatory uh, affects the technical parts. Uh, there is another side, of course. It's all like, like competition between shield and sword. For example, one of our key partners, the Kaspersky Lab, very well-known anti-malware uh, company, uh, makes some researches about the security issues in different ways, in different kinds. And in their last report that they presented at the end of the uh, 2018, they pointed out that uh, there is a very huge amount of new development in so-called cyber weapon in both state-sponsored and non-state-sponsored and so on. Uh, that's because uh, regulatory moves create some new protection measures and it causes uh, some malicious actors to create some other tools to break them. This is also the consequence of uh, regulatory moves. So this is just a very brief uh, 
view from my point of how regulatory moves uh, affects the technical parts of the internet and so I will be glad to answer your questions if any. Thank you very much Mikhail. Uh, yes we have a question there and there and there. Just one second. Hello? Now it, now it is working. Thank you. Um, so if the authorities uh, are imposing certain um, measures for the companies, uh, the uh, internet providers or telecom, uh, telcos, um, are they uh, also enforcing those companies, tho those actors to, to, um, uh, uh, to um, bear all the burden of the um, necessary investments? Uh, for example, uh, if you are obliged to keep uh, records for, I don't know, 12 months backwards, this can cost a lot in terms of uh, storage. Or uh, if, you, uh, um, if you are obliged by a certain law to uh, encrypt to a st certain standard all the traffic, this would be um, assuming one should invest in, uh, in equipment, in very ex expensive equipment. Are such uh, obligations uh, somehow... Uh, uh, coming along with financing, or uh, all, all the operators need to support all the all this burden. Burden. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Uh, not for all of them. I should say that we have another law in Russia that is the law about critical information infrastructure. Uh, and it says that uh, companies who want to fit all this requirement to. Uh, to to be considered as a critical infrastructure, should meet some standards and there is a list of companies and some uh, certain objects of critical infrastructures and uh, all these uh, requirements are applied only to this list so uh, these requirements are not all, uh, not for all companies or and all telco uh, objects but if uh, any provider wants to uh, provide services for governmental organizations or if they want to um, have the you know label of a statewide operator or something like that uh, they have to pass through the certification process and all that uh, requ uh, requirements that I listed before, they are part of the certification process. And of course, that's all expenses are on the business. Because they just want to be in a standard to uh, get all these uh, advantages of being the critical infrastructure operator. It's, uh, it's very similar to uh, air companies or ship companies that also have to pass some kind of uh, procedures of uh, standardizations. Uh, okay, thank you. There was another question from the gentleman behind the cameraman. Thank you. Um, my name is Bogdan Manolea from the Digital Rights Group APTI in Romania. So just one clarification first. So if I understand correctly your presentation, it means that uh, according to the new GDPR-like uh, legislation that you have in Russia, you need to collect more data in order to access the Wi-Fi from the users. Was that correct or I misunderstood? Uh, not actually. Um, I was talking about that not every, for example, ho if the hotel provides Wi-Fi services, uh, in previous year they had to collect the information about the user. Now they can't because the hotel uh, does not fit requirements to personal data operator. Okay. So uh, it's just uh, lead to invention of new, new, new kind of bodies personal data operator that uh, should also be certified in a, in a proper way. And only just a few companies that uh, prove that they can uh, store the personal data in a proper way, they can collect data and uh, you know, uh, help the hotel to provide Wi-Fi to, to everyone. 
So basically, if you go into Russia and you connect to a Wi-Fi, you're almost sure that this is an anonymous or quasi-anonymous connection, right? Uh, yeah, correct, correct. Uh, okay. Actually, it's uh, the same situation uh, to the many European countries when you come to the hotel and you try to register in the hotel Wi-Fi. Uh, there is a form when you can type in your your data in, in any way. Uh, and uh, it's not a hotel who collects them. It's a special operator who provides the service to the hotel to okay. collect that data and prove that you are the right person who really owns this data. Okay. And, and how can the collect know that I am the one who say I am in order to connect to the Wi-Fi? Do I need to give my personal ID number so they know exactly who I am? It depends on local legislation. Okay. It depends on legislation of every particular country. Interesting. Because this sounds to me like the GDPR opposite legislation, not the GDPR-like legislation. Not actually, because you're giving your data not to everyone who cannot store it in a proper way. And after they seeing your phone, your email, and some other information goes to spammers, go to fishers, go to malware distributors. But uh, you can be sure that all data that you give to this form is properly collected by the specially certified operator. And special agencies. Um, okay, so, and the question now, but your presentation was very interesting because it showed a lot of uh, real issues when regulation, um, uh, you know, they, they create problems for, for ISPs. But maybe uh, you can, and the others can also comment on this, uh, on the tone, because it, it really looked like, you know, this is happening, like online content blocking, uh, personal data. And I think we need to have more discussion on uh, how these regulatory proposals or laws may actually work, if they work. Because, uh, because uh, your presentation sounded, it was so neutral that it sounded that any regulation that it passes, we just fix the wires and everything will be solved. And I think it's, it's a bit more problematic on that. Maybe you can comment also on, on the way uh, the, the ISP community in Russia reacted to some of these proposals. And I, other, other speakers can, uh, can uh, give their insights from their own country. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, the legislation process have uh, the stage of public comments. After the law, uh, the, the project of the law is uh, publicly, uh, you know, is published on a website of our parliament. Uh, there is a, a stage of public com of collecting the comments from the professional community, from technical community, from ISP, and all that comments are investigated, uh, uh, they are researched, and after that, uh, it, it's like an iterative process. They make a new version of the law, and they also are collecting the command from the ISP, and uh, they're doing step by step uh, before they make a law that's, uh, you know, that feeds to both the regulatory bodies and to professional communities. Did I answer your question? No, not really, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> Hi, I'm David from Georgia. Uh, it's not a secret that a number of experts express their concern uh, regarding the reasons why Russia are propose, is proposing uh, the measures or the things you were describing, like root servers and so on and so on. And I have the question, do you personally believe that this is a good idea and th that this will be like um, the measure for overall good, for example. Do you personally believe in that? Uh, me personally, like representative of Dota, are you or me personally, like uh, Mikhail? <laughs> That's a different question. Okay, nevertheless, I believe that uh, the internet should be sustainable, it should be resilient and so on. And I believe that we should take all the proper measures to, to obtain that goal. That's, what, that, that's my point. Okay. Yes. Um, the previous uh, question asked for other comments from the panel, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to say something as well. Uh, my name is Hisham Ibrahim, I work for the RPNCC, but I'm speaking as a techie um, on this particular point. Um, 
there uh, we um, there's a lot of um, there's gaps that need to be filled right on the technical level we all know this uh, for a long time it was left to the technical community to figure out and do the right thing whether it was from the operators from the others uh, we've seen in some cases they've done this in some cases they haven't um, now, some governments now are, t are t trying to fill those gaps through re um, legislation and regulation in their countries. Now, nobody can actually say what they can or cannot do in their countries, their government, and they get to pass their laws and legislations. However, I do believe that there is room for, if, if, if the, the, the governments do not necessarily want to regulate uh, everything, and I don't think they should be regulating everything, because we've seen cases, I've seen cases where if a government regulates all the way down to how things should be done, then that legislation becomes obsolete in a couple of years, or the operators find ways to just minimally comply with something without actually doing what was the initial goal of doing so. And I think governments see that, so they don't want to go to that level of legislation. Uh, but also there's something for the technical community to actually make sure, like in, in this case, that there are root servers in the country. That's, that's something that should have been there whether, you know, whether there was legislation or not. There should be interconnection within the country. This is, these are gaps that unfortunately some of the, the operators and some people that are doing the technical operations in the countries have failed to do two operators not talking to each other because of competition, so they rather peer outside of the country rather than inside the country. That that is not right. Is the best way to do this is to regulate them, to actually peer? I've seen cases where that has been done and for over 10 years still the issue is still there. They, they, they connect through an exchange but they still send their traffic outside of the country. So that balance is not, it's, it's, it's not a binary question, yes or no, it's just a more understanding towards how to build better networks would definitely help everybody and would, would not give room for any organization or body to actually come and say, well, you're not actually doing this the right way. That's just my take, personally. Thank you so much. I absolutely agree. And just another example to illustrate that, for example, uh, I personally really believe that self-regulation is some, uh, sometimes is much more efficient than regulation from governmental bodies. For example, uh, we in Russia have no any legislation about the domain names, and all the domain industry is self-regulated. Uh, but when it comes, for example, to ISPs, uh, we know that uh, some of them are making some it's much more cost effective for them to peer outside of the country, for example. And we know that if any, in case of any impact, for example, you know, earthquake or something like that, we will just break the uh, n Russian network into a few parts that we will not be connected with each other. And uh, of course, we are doing everything to not make it happen. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. One more comment. One more comment, uh, Dusan Stuchevich. Uh, Sox, Grancy, whatever. Uh, so um, I just want to ask uh, how much uh, in the audience we have governmental people. Just one. So we are, we are talking to the governments, uh, or uh, we are we supposed to talk to the government that they don't have to build uh, uh, so deep uh, legislation, that they are wrong, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, what I'm trying uh, to tell you, uh, the problem with the governments is uh, that they do mistakes, uh, their agencies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, what Mikhail was saying, as critical infrastructures uh, also le leaks data, personal data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, there is also uh, a stake on them. So we uh, need to judge them whether uh, those agencies are uh, good and uh, it, they, are they fulfilling criteria to be uh, critical infrastructure. On the other side, I want to uh, uh, start one, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, one action here. So whenever 
anyone say GDPR, one panda is dying in China. <laughs> so please, be aware of that. Thank you for this uh, comment, Dushan. Um, I would like to uh, uh, thank you also, Michael, for the wonderful presentation, very, uh, very interesting, um, and uh, a lot of comments for that. Um, and uh, yeah, our, our discussion about keeping uh, traffic local actually ties really nicely with uh, the next presentation and our next speaker. So, Eric. So, yes, uh, thank you. I will start with a question for you. Uh, do you think we can exchange places? I need the rest of you yeah, to sure. the main screen. Thank you. So, um, I'm uh, Eric from uh, Interland Internet Exchange. Uh, we are an association of uh, Romanian ISPs owning, uh, owning uh, the Internet Exchange uh, platform. And uh, I will talk about the peering scene in uh, Romania. Um, I want to ask you, uh, who knows what peering is? Please raise your hand. Do you know what peering is? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's start with some basic principles. Uh, peering uh, uh, between networks is keeping local traffic local. This is the, the main thing about peering. And uh, also peering means higher speeds for, uh, for your end users in your networks. Also, peering means uh, low latency connection between hosts, between different hosts, because uh, they are uh, di directly connected. And also, peering means traffic optimization and uh, cost reduction. Uh, when we talk about uh, peering uh, between uh, three or more uh, networks, uh, we have an internet exchange platform or internet exchange point. In Romania, we have uh, three internet exchanges. We have uh, Ronix, which was the first one. We have Interlan, which I present, and we have Balkanix, which is owned by the former incumbent, uh, Telecom Romania. And also, we have the big five players on the ISP market. Uh, we have Vodafone Romania, uh, which appears only at Ronix. We have Orange, which appears at uh, two exchanges, uh, Interlan and Ronix. And, um, uh, RCS, RDS, and UPC, they don't appear at any exchange. And you have Telecom Romania, which is owning one internet exchange and is peering at uh, the other two. So um, this is the image. Uh, for the next slide, I used some uh, data from um, RIPE Atlas, IXP Country Jedi. Um, uh, we have a matrix uh, uh, showing uh, different hosts in different networks. Uh, I want to ask you if you know what uh, AS number is. If you can raise your hand, if you know what an AS number is. Okay. And an AS number defines a network. So if we talk about AS number, we talk about networks. Each network has a unique AS number. Uh, so we have the AS numbers of the networks, and this is a matrix that is showing how traffic is being made uh, between, the, between the, the network, between, be, between different networks. So this is the matrix of IXP lands. If uh, the, the little square is colored, that means the traffic between the two networks is made through an internet exchange platform. In Romania, as I told you earlier, we have uh, three peering lands. We have Ronix in light blue. We have um, uh, Interland in dark blue and uh, Balkanics in light green. Uh, we can notice that uh, the two of the five Romanian ISPs do not appear at any exchange platform. And uh, also the former incumbent uh, owns an ISP and appears at the other two exchanges. There is another uh, matrix, um, and I have to put another question. Uh, if you know what uh, latency means and what's the importance of latency in, in network connections. Does anybody know what latency is? Okay, latency is the time that uh, uh, is, a, is the time between the, the, the two connections that uh, it has to be lower in order to be good. So um, this is a matrix showing the networks in Romania and um, we have uh, uh, ripe probes uh, in each network or not. 
And uh, we can see that Vodafone Romania has no probes, so we can have no uh, we have no data from uh, Vodafone. We have uh, also UPC Romania, which has some probes, but uh, they are offline. So we can compare only data from RCS RDS or the Engine Telecom Romania. Uh, so, uh, what we see there is that um, the orange green, uh, the orange uh, squares means that um, the latency is medium, is between 10 and 50 milliseconds between hosts. So, this is the speed between the two hosts in the two networks. Um, so, RCS RDS and Telecom Romania has uh, uh, generally a uh, medium latency between 10 and 50 milliseconds. And uh, Orange Mania has a good latency, it's very low, so it's good, it's good to be low, uh, bit, uh, below 10 milliseconds. We can notice also some red dots, these uh, are uh, bad examples. Um, uh, red dots means that the latency between the two networks is uh, over 50 milliseconds, and uh, this happened between RCS, RDS and Telecom Romania. So the traffic between the two networks seems to be somehow longer than the, the other. Uh, we have the Romanian IXP, uh, uh, Romanian uh, traffic actually. And if uh, it's, it, this uh, the diagram, it shows if the traffic is into the country, if it's out of the country. So in dark green, we have country IXP traffic. That means, uh, which means that uh, the traffic is going. It's uh, staying in the country and is made through an internet exchange platform. And uh, in light green, we have uh, traffic that uh, it stays in the country, but it not, is it not exchanged through an internet exchange platform. Uh, that means it, uh, it, it is exchanged uh, maybe through direct peering connections or metro connections. And in light brown, we have the traffic that goes out of the country. So we can see that uh, in Romania, most of the traffic uh, stays in the country, which is a good thing, I think. And finally, we have a map of, um, of uh, uh, geopets of IPv4 uh, uh, traffic. And uh, we can notice that uh, most of the pets are staying in the country. And uh, some pets goes out of the country uh, through Frankfurt, uh, Amsterdam, California, and Japan. It's a weird thing. But uh, this is uh, this is the, um, the situation about um, about uh, global CDNs presence at internet exchanges. We have uh, good uh, good presence of uh, global CDNs. We have Akamai, we have Facebook, Netflix, Google, Microsoft, Cloudflare, Yahoo present at at least one of the three internet exchanges in Romania. Uh, maybe the picture is somehow uh, disturbing, so I, I made a table, and we can you can see uh, where the each CDN are uh, where, uh, are present. So we have a good representation of global uh, the uh, content delivery networks in Romania. Uh, this is a summary of exchanges. We have uh, traffic between peak traffic between 50 gigs and 200 gigs, and this is not quite so much. We have uh, uh, ASNs present in the exchanges between 35 and 100. We have a lot of uh, facilities in Romania in which uh, internet exchanges are present. Uh, some of the internet exchanges are delivering uh, video streams and uh, multicast services. We have uh, seven DNS routes in Romania. Uh, the I route from Netnode is located at uh, Ronix, and we have six of them in uh, Interland. We have the route from uh, University of Maryland. We have E route from NASA MS Center. We have L route from ICANN. We have uh, J route from VeriSign. F route from Internet System Consortium, and uh, K route from OpenCC. Also, Interland uh, has uh, the uh, S112 service uh, provided for uh, for its uh, its peers, and uh, also has a RIS uh, route collector from RIPNCC, and is using the ISP Manager uh, uh, platform for management uh, of uh, peerings. I will take a look in the next slide on the region. Um, in um, Number of uh, ASNs, Romania has uh, 1,271 ASNs. The data is from January, but it's quite uh, actual. Um, 
the Central Eastern countries, which uh, you, you can see in, uh, in uh, green, they have almost 4,000 ASN, which means 4,000 networks. Um, the eastern, uh, the southeastern countries have almost 2,000, uh, over 2,000 uh, ASNs, so over 2,000 networks in the region. And the rest of the eastern countries has, uh, they have um, uh, almost 9,000 uh, 9, ASNs. Uh, in southeastern Europe, Romania has the highest number of uh, ASNs and um, also a big number of IPv4 addresses, but uh, it seems that Turkey has the highest number of domains and also the highest number of uh, IPv4 addresses. Uh, we noticed also a lot of uh, IPv4 addresses in Bulgaria, Greece and uh, Serbia and Croatia. This is a distribution of uh, number of ASNs. You can notice Romania in blue, uh, Bulgaria in uh, orange, and Turkey in, uh, in gray. So this is the number of networks in southeastern region. Um, we have also, I have also some, um, some uh, peering, peering DB stats for the SC region. We have uh, a large number of IXs uh, and facilities in Romania, Bulgaria, and Turkey in the region. And uh, we can see that uh, Romania has uh, 28 out of 86 facilities and uh, 3 out of uh, 18 exchanges. It seems that Bulgaria is a uh, champion of uh, internet exchanges in the region. Uh, Bulgaria has uh, 5 internet exchanges. Um, in Central Eastern Europe, we have um, Poland, which has, the number, uh, which has the highest number of ASNs and uh, also the highest number of IPv4 addresses available and also the highest number of domains and Romania is on the second place with uh, the number of uh, in number of networks and uh, on the third place in number of IPv4 addresses because Czechia is uh, also have uh, uh, a higher a high, high number of uh, domains and uh, IPv4 addresses so the Poland Romania and Czechia are the leaders in the in the region you can see in blue Poland with number of ASNs, uh, which means number of networks, Romania in orange and uh, Czechia in grey. In rest of uh, Eastern Europe, we of course have Russia with uh, over 6,000 ASNs and the uh, highest number of uh, domains for 4.5 million and 46 million addresses, IPv4 addresses. Uh, and also we have uh, Ukraine with uh, 2,000 ASNs uh, in the region, uh, in the country, and uh, also uh, over 10 million IPv4 addresses. So Romania in this, uh, in this part of, uh, of, the, of the Europe is on the, on the third place. This is the pie of, uh, of ASNs in Eastern Europe. You can notice Russia in blue, Romania in uh, Ukraine, sorry, in uh, orange, and Romania in, uh, in gray. Some conclusions that um, um, big Romanian ISPs, I think we should, uh, they should consider to peer in the country because the traffic must uh, stay local. And uh, also we they can consider to peer at uh, Romanian ISPs. Uh, we noticed that uh, global CDNs have good presence at Romanian internet exchanges and uh, also that Romania is an important hub for the AC region along with uh, Bulgaria and Turkey. Now a few words about the Romanian NOG community. Um, we started the uh, Romanian NOG in 2014. Uh, it followed the uh, 25th uh, URX forum in Bucharest. Uh, and of course, the great karaoke night. Uh, we had, um, at first edition, we had uh, 141 attendees from 19 countries and 25 speakers. And uh, we had a lot of topics, uh, policy and governance, IXPs, network operators, CDNs, equipment vendors, and uh, security. The second edition was uh, next year in 2015. Uh, the number of attendees was uh, 147 from in 11 countries. We had uh, also 19 speakers, and we were uh, talking about policy and governance, IXPs, security, network operators, and uh, equipment vendors. We have some new things at Ronop3. We have a meeting clubbed with the ION meeting from ISOC uh, in Bucharest. So it was a joint meeting, uh, Ronop with the ION meeting from ISOC. 
And um, after the RONOG, we, uh, we had uh, two RIPE training days for uh, Romanian allies. We had almost 150 attendees from 30 countries and 12 speakers. And of course, the topics were policy and governance, ISP security, IPv6, and uh, uh, DNS uh, security. The fourth edition was followed by uh, three RIPE training days. Uh, we had over 200 attendees uh, at uh, RONOG 4 from 17 countries, and uh, we had uh, 21 speakers. This, uh, the topics were the same, policy and governance, infrastructure, network operators, security, IoT, and IPv6. Last year, uh, we had uh, 200 attendees from 16 countries and 16 speakers, and a lot of topics. You can see top trends and internet developments, network operations, and security awareness content delivery, key solutions and equipment technologies, IPv6 deployment, data center technologies. And uh, this year, the meeting uh, will be held in October, the 1st of October, so you should save the date, you should attend the meeting, it will be very interesting. Uh, we expect uh, over 215 attendees uh, from, uh, and uh, to, to, to 20 speakers, sorry. And uh, of course, uh, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of topics to discuss. Now, if we have questions. Thank you very much, uh, Eric, for this presentation. Thank you. Great uh, to learn about Ronog and that it's going strong. Question for all of you guys. Anybody attended uh, Ronog or any other NOG in Southeast Europe? All right, some people. Well, you know when the next uh, Romanian one is taking place. Um, yes, questions for Eric. Uh, there is uh, a mic is coming to you. Or is it? Uh, it's not a question. Uh, Tiber Gundu, I'm from uh, Ronix, uh, representing the um, uh, association of local ISPs. And I wanted to point to um, uh, our colleague uh, Eric that uh, Ronix is also connected to, to Google. One of the slides was not. I uh, use the data from bgp.ag.net, and uh, yeah, maybe. Well, it's not uh, such a. Something to uh, actually, from a traffic perspective, it is a big deal, uh, both in Ronis and in um, Interland. I guess uh, the uh, majority, the uh, overwhelming majority of the traffic comes from the CDNs nowadays. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I have a short comment regarding the number of domain names in Russia. It's about uh, a little bit outdated information. Actually, I have about 5 million domain names in .ru and about 800,000 in .ref. That is several KDM for Russia. So totally, it's about 6 million domain names, totally. Anybody has any questions? about Ronog or how an IXP is run. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, and uh, let's peer, don't forget. All right. Um, next up, I have Andrea. Uh, do, do you have the clicker? No, I, I, I'm uh. actually, I don't think I'm going to use much slides because I've been uh, already showed. I only looked at the, at the distribution of uh, root servers in the region, and I um, and I noticed. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Andrea Beccali. I'm from ICANN. <laughs> so I just and I just uh, wanted to check before coming to this panel, and um, there is indeed uh, room for improvement. You see, in uh, in southeastern Europe region, I think it's only Bulgaria, Romania. Uh, and Greece that actually host root servers. Uh, the rest of the Balkans they, they have not. And um, it's actually not complicated and not that expensive to host uh, a root server. Um, ICANN, which runs the root server L, which is um, probably the most uh, um, um, uh, common root server across the globe. Um, you really, you just literally have to send an email to me, and then I'll put you in contact with my uh, colleagues in ICANN that will guide you through 
from the technical requirements to all the steps to activate the server. And that's something that will actually will um, improve uh, your uh, performance and, the, and the, the, the robustness of the network in your countries. I just wanted just to, you know, to continue the discussion about the importance of, um, of taking care of the DNS industry and the technical layer of the internet as it also plays a fundamental role into the overall development of the internet economy of one country. I was looking at the number of, um, um, dom of uh, registered domain names in, in the region, and uh, if you compare the size of the population in, in, uh, in Romania, and if you compare the, you know, the, uh, the size of the economy, there is huge potential for growth, and I'm, and I'm sure that if you would map it, um, the last five years of GDP growth and overall growth of the internet sector in, uh, in Romania, you will find a correlation. Even myself coming here, I find around the city more Dota row uh, you know, companies or advertisement going on in services. I even went to check with Alexa, I think it's next slide, it's not clicking, yes. You know, the traffic in Romania, and uh, well, it's very tiny, but you can see, I think, google.ro is the fourth most visited uh, website in the, in, the, in the country, and then uh, olx.ro, which, um, which, uh, which is a kind of second-hand platform to buy and sell things, and, uh, and uh, the rest is international website. Um, on my slides, actually, I, I put some information on no? Okay, backwards. <laughs> On the, what are the root server system and how to get them. But, ah, that's why. I was keeping it on the web. But um, we actually, yesterday, uh, we held uh, on the day zero an Internet 101 session on, on explaining how the Internet works. Uh, only the I youth, uh, city youth was fortunate enough to participate, and I really encourage to have these kind of uh, sessions at uh, next city open to everybody. I think you will find it very interesting, and I, I, you know, I'm amazed on how much you have been following some of the previous slides. Uh, even myself working at Reagan, but not having a technical training, sometimes I have hard times in figuring out. Okay, wait, wait, AS, yes, I remember. I've been told what NAS is, but it's not so common. But you know, it, it's important to understand that um, this layer of the internet is no longer something for techies only. You know, the way that the internet uh, is playing such an important role of our lives, the discussion that we had in the two previous panels um, uh, about you know, the uses of the internet, they cannot be detached from that layer. And what we are seeing in ICANN, uh, and increasingly, is that um, the urgency that is felt to address some of the main issues around around the internet, about the you know the the, the uses of the internet, the dangerous uses of the internet, um, is bringing more urgency to have regulation in place. But regulation done without understanding how the internet works can be more dangerous than the, you know than than the actually living like this, and. Um, I was thinking before when I was listening to the presentation, um, you must have seen the, the awful images of the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris in flames. And uh, the cathedral took around 700 years to be built. And then I was watching the news, I was shocked. I, used, I lived in Paris for four years. And then I heard and I learned from the news that actually the cathedral had no water sprinkles. If you look up in the roof, you can see water sprinkles here, here, there, and there. You know? In a way, the way the internet was built is very similar. You, the internet, if you count all the, you know, from the first ARPANET is now, what, 50 years old, something more than that? And uh, it was built without thinking about water sprinkles in it. You know? A way to ensure that uh, it's a safe system that uh, something can go wrong and you have to you know, be, be, be ready to address it. And we are now saying that uh, this is a need and it becomes, you know, becomes more and more a urgent need. 
And the answers to those needs sometimes are not only, okay, let's put water sprinkles, but are, you know, let's build a different internet or a more secure internet. I was um, um, in Barcelona in February at a very large event which is called the Mobile World Congress. This is an event that uh, it's known because usually the latest gadgets of mobile phones or, 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 um, or flashy new tools are launched, but it's also a meeting of network operators and uh, uh, network providers. And the big talk of the day there was um, 5G, of course, like the next level of, um, of uh, I mean, the next um, uh, standard for um, mobile communication, which, by the way, is not there yet, but it's still, I mean, it's still, uh, the, the standard has not been agreed yet, but still, it's, it's the talk of the day. And what, what surprises me is that uh, openly, um, network operators providing these 5G services are talking about having a more secure internet, which already is a contradiction in term, because if you have another internet, which is not the internet, but it's more secure, maybe you should find another name. That's one of my first observation. But a more secure internet, where you have full control of all the devices that are there, where the speed and latency are, are tremendous. And by the way, if you want to access that, well, it's a specialized service. You should pass through me, and I will gladly let you navigate into this network, but you have to pay me. Um, we had this meeting with the chief technical, technical technology officer at Telefonica, a large telecom operator, and he said, you know what? My goal is, not, uh, is nothing more than making sure that in a, in a limited space, I can have all these IoT devices connected to a 5G network, and it's not as bad as your DNS. He was using you know, those words, and he said, well, you know, the DNS had some flaws, but uh, this discussion, you know, they, they seems to be very technical, but at the end of the day, they go back into issues that we thought we already discussed and addressed, like network neutrality, you know? Was, is, is everybody allowed uh, to navigate in the same internet, have the same speed, access the same website? Well, suddenly, what we thought was a talk from a few years back is now back on, uh, on the stage. In ICANN, we are having a discussion internally of what is the impact of 5G networks, what is the impact of the Internet of Things over the DNS. Even ourselves, we are not you know, completely fully clear because the, the complexity is uh, staggering. Um, so to, to go, just to wrap it up and to go back, what I really encourage you is that um, having an understanding and um, getting closer to this um, the, uh, technical aid of the internet becomes you know, something that probably we, when we look back we will ask ourselves how we, when we studying those things at school, you know? Because we rely so much on the internet but we know so little on how it works and how crucial can, can, could be. And, and particularly now in the coming year we will see more and more attempts of legislation trying to address some of the issues that have a direct impact on how this layer works. Uh, the latest one, and I, I'm, 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 I'm sorry for the panda that will be die just now, but killing a new panda is the GDPR, which was, a, was, a, was, a, you know, was an alarm, it was a bell that rang from us, but suddenly um, a system that allows everybody uh, to access the information of who registered a website was not compliant with the GDPR. And uh, no, this system was built without thinking about it, you know, what, what in the 80s, to, to, you know, to make sure that, and the internet in the 80s was something that, you know, you probably, you cannot even fathom what it was the internet in the 80s, but it just developed like this, and it's distributed database across the globe. Now, the GDPR, which is in effect, and as an extraterritorial extra reach, basically implies that everybody that operates a registry and a registrar, and so when you register a domain name, have to comply to the GDPR regulation, and that has a huge implication on how the policies are made. Now, ICANN is in the center of that, but ICANN alone 
is not going to find any solution because ICANN works through this model of multi-stakeholder participation and, uh, and community and getting people in. The quality of the solution and that we can find, it's only equal to the quality of the people that will come into the room and participate into that. So now that we are seeing how uh, changes, tweaks, interest in regulate the internet may have uh, an impact on how the internet works and how we take the internet for granted and we think that it's like this and will continue to be like this. Well, maybe now we have to wake up. We are not yet in the blasting fire like with the Notre Dame Cathedral, but we may get close to that. Uh, another things that I learned, uh, we learned, is that um, just in April we uncovered probably the largest ever attack on the DNS perpetrated across uh, the world. Countries were targeted, um, and the attack was going on for a sea turtle. You heard about that? Maybe it wasn't widely covered by the news, but the, the guess uh, a state actor was behind this attack. And this is basically hacking a very simple, uh, uh, well, not simple, but for someone that is well versed into how the DNS works, is basically poisoning the DNS, rerouting you to a fake website, and you think you're logging into Gmail. Gmail was actually one of the one of the uh, companies that have been attacked. You're thinking that you are logging into Gmail. It's not Gmail, but you know your server has been uh, hijacked, and suddenly you put your login and password into into a fake website that is taking this information and just uh, and just stealing from you and then using it for you know for probably not well-intended uh, meanings. So, um, ICANN will have um, its next meeting, let's say it's not in the region, it's Marrakesh, but it's closest to the region here uh, at the end of June. Um, I recommend, if you can, to come. If you are not able to travel to Marrakesh because it's far, it's too expensive, you can follow all the meetings online. But uh, consider getting more involved, and ICANN is putting a lot of effort and resources in getting more people into the way it works, and, uh, and even, even providing this kind of trainings to understand how the internet works at each ICANN meetings. We can follow them online. And, um, and I stop here. If you have more comments, questions, I hope we will have a discussion which uh, give us more time to go around these issues. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation, Andrea. Uh, let me check quickly with the audience. Do you guys have any questions? Uh, I see somebody's raising their hand. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the thought-provoking discussion. Um, I would like to go back to one of the first uh, slides that you had. This is the root server's geographical locations. Uh, I remember from the memory a couple of locations. So I would like to ask what predetermines the geographical, physical location of these root servers? Is there any reason to it? Uh, is it just random? Uh, and whether or not these kind of geographical uh, positioning of these root servers somehow affects their efficiency or effectiveness? Uh, maybe affects the local infrastructure in any way. Thank you. So I, you know, I'll ask for the help of my ripe colleague to give you all the. Uh, <laughs> but you know, the root server location in itself, with the one that you see here in the map, is where physically the machine is. Okay, and of course. Uh, you only access the information the root server ideally wants. Then the information is cached. But this once, you know, the closer it is to your computer, to your router at home, helps your connection to be faster and more resilient. Um, Isham, yeah. did they pass? Yeah, well, so um, the locations on the map here, they represent L roots only, right? Yeah. But right. this one is L roots, the other one are... Yes. Uh, 
So, so the ones that you see in front of you here on the map are just L root. There are more routes, and, and you probably heard in Eric's talk that there are multiple routes within certain country. Basically, what happens is uh, I, whether an ISP or an operator based on the root operator's policy would apply for hosting a root server in the country. So it's not like the root server operators are the ones that determine whether they should put one in your country or not. They actually look for somebody to be able to host this, and based on the, the, the equipment size and and uh, what they determine, then uh, they end up uh, saying whether they put that in exchange or whether they need it to be at an ISP or a data center or and so on and so forth. Uh, the reason why you would want them, and this is a bit where what was touched on in the first presentation, is uh, that uh, when you're looking up a domain for the first time, it, you, it goes to the root and asks it first for for that. If it doesn't, if it doesn't have a record of the IP address. Uh, of that domain, uh, and if that is not in the country, then that traffic ends up leaving the country. Um, there's a lot of reasons why that would be bad because, well, first of all, if somebody's doing surveillance and they're going to see how that is done, and especially that the DNS queries are done in, in, in plain text so people can actually see them. But then others monetize on that and they sell the information, oh, this is the stuff that people are interested in in this country. So the more localized it is, the more better it is, plus, of course, latency and, and, and performance for, for people instead of having the traffic leave the country and come back again. That's very quickly take. Thank you. I have a comment from and Eric. And, and I also, Dusha, also have and a small comment. And go, go, go. Okay. Uh, when it comes to root servers, we're talking not about the geography, actually, but we're talking about the network topology. And that is why root servers should be placed strategically in mostly in the major network operators like Tier 1 or in the IXP show. So it should be easily accessible to as much networks as it's even possible. I've been having Eric waiting <laughs> for a comment as well. No problem. Uh, just a short comment. Uh, three, uh, four years ago, in 2015, uh, we had this is a map uh, showing only the L routes. Uh, but uh, we had in 2015, uh, uh, four years ago, we had in uh, Bucharest in Romania only two of them, only the iRoot from Network, which was hosted by Ronix, and the JRoot from Verisign, which was hosted uh, by Interland, and uh, Bulgaria, Sofia, and uh, uh, and Belgrade in, uh, in Serbia, they had six or seven uh, or seven uh, uh, DNS root servers uh, in their cities. So I started uh, a project to bring more L routes to Romania in an in internet exchange, uh, so everybody could uh, could benefit of all of them. And um, short comment: L route was the last one uh, because it was very hard to find someone to put to to be in touch. I know that you you should be because I I, I noticed your name, but I want I wasn't be, I wasn't able to find any email address from you. So I have to chase someone from ICANN at conferences and uh, and uh, to be in touch with uh, someone from ICANN. So it was not so easy. Maybe That's why I see maybe you should important. improve it. That's why CDG is important. You see, yes. we see each other. Thank you. Fantastic, Dusha. Uh, I was trying to make a comment what Mikhail uh, was saying, but I will uh, go further. Geography that you know, and uh, uh, especially when it comes to politics, it, we don't care about that. So it, it's uh, not that uh, we are selecting some countries because of the political issue or they are a uh, member of European uh, Union or, uh, or something like that. It's only technical reason why we choose this place or uh, we. Uh, I'm saying in front of ICANN, uh, uh, is it convenient to have uh, root server in that uh, that country. So there is no politics, there is no geography. Geography is totally different, uh, as he's uh, he's saying. Uh, uh, topology, ne network topology. Uh, 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 you can uh, easily find some uh, countries in in. Uh, 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 especially on islands, uh, uh, connected with only one cable. Uh, so if you uh, uh, cut this cable, you will cut the internet and you will uh, do what the Russians are trying to do with the, with the country, so they will be isolated. So uh, uh, in, in a sense, uh, don't mix geography with, uh, with this. And uh, one comment from the presentation of uh, 
Andrea. So uh, in one uh, on one side, uh, uh, he said we we need more education, more to uh, to know how the internet works. On the other side, if you are learning too much, you will create DDoS attacks on DNS. So where is the level of knowledge that we need to know? Uh, do you guys have any more questions? I'm, I'm assuming your question is rhetorical, by the way. <laughs> um, do you guys have any more questions for Andrea? Uh, if not, we have two more presentations. Um, Hisham is up next. Yep. Thank you. Um, can I have the slides? Um, Hisham Ibrahim, Ripen CC, while they're pulling up the slides. Uh, who here hasn't heard of IP version 4 depletion and that IP version 4 is running out or IP version 6? Everybody has, right? So, okay, this is going to make my life a lot easier uh, and also harder to try to get you interested in something that you've heard of before. And I think, yeah, my first slide actually covered this. So, headlines from all the way back to 2012 suggest and say, talk about IP version 4 almost running out and, and what will happen uh, with it running out. And this is, this is a topic that has been discussed in a lot of either IG forums uh, similar to this or dialogues or whether technical for uh, and others and this is why there it is no surprise to me that you're actually mm, all familiar with this topic and yesterday at the um, at the day zero event we had a very nice discussion and I was actually very impressed also by the level of uh, knowledge that they had uh, the attendees and 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 keeping up with some of the the issues that even people in industry today still struggle in in following with um, the slides, I have a lot of slides here for reference. I'm not going to go through them all for the sake of time. But this just very quickly shows a timeline of what was actually happening. So in 2012, well, actually 2011, uh, IANA, the main reservoir, ran out of IP version 4 addresses, which was the global depletion. And then uh, each one of the five RIRs that manage these space started uh, running out one by one based on policies that were put uh, by the community. Um, uh, put forward. So uh, four out of the five RIRs actually had a final, uh, a soft landing policy, which meant that they wanted to save safeguard some space for for newcomers. Uh, but one which was Aaron did not have one. This is why it, 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 they they decided to just you know hit the wall running and just run out when they run out. Uh, so in 2012, this is where the headlines you saw earlier, the RIPE NCC was saying, we hit that final slash eight, that final continuous block. And this is where all that discussion was happening. Now, as of last year, April 2018, that last big continuous block, we ran out of it as well. We gave out the last, uh, so we would give out in smaller chunks, so, uh, which are slash 22. And, if you want to think about this, think about it as a uh, bag of chips or crisps, right? When you start out, you get the big pieces, you can eat them as much as you want, but then as you start going on and on, you get the smaller pieces, right? And you start collecting them together and trying to eat them, which is pretty much where things are, uh, we're moving and going. So now you can only get the smaller chunks, which were the thousand IP addresses. No matter how big you were, you could only qualify for a thousand IP address, whether you're an existing member or a new member. And last year, that big continuous block ran out. Now, we do have some extra space, which is shown in green there, and, and reserved space as well, without going into detail. But that's what we've been allocating since last year. So even that one big continuous block ran out as well. So now we're allocating out of the other bits uh, that we have there. Um, and the, the more significant reason for this talk now, maybe bef from other talks before, is this is probably going to be the last CDIG uh, we can send in front of you as representatives from the RIPE NCC and saying you can still get that thousand IP addresses, that small bit of, of, of chips you may not be able to get next year because we, the RIPE NCC, um, the, uh, we're, we're giving out of the green bits there. That we're projected to run out by February 2020. Uh, which means even for those that were complaining about saying, well, it should have been bigger and we, could get, we couldn't get more and we came late in the game, we just don't have the space to give out. Now, 
leading to that period, well, basically, um, and yeah, this just goes through it, that uh, we, we've been giving out the smaller bits. We have some stuff reserved for stuff like exchange points and others. Like I said, I won't go through all the slides. But there is there's some stuff that we can do. So there's some space that was left for like unforeseen circumstances and stuff. And this is part of the policy discussions that are being happening now at the uh, on the right uh, mailing list, the public policy mailing list, where people are determining what to do with that. There are some also uh, discussions about making that slash 22 even smaller. Sorry, I'm, I'm lost on the slides here. But some are talking about making that slash 22 into a slash 24. So instead of giving out a thousand IP addresses, we give even smaller chunks, which are 256 IP addresses. Now, just in an effort to try to prolong as much as they can, um, giving out IP version 4, but that will not do it anymore. There is a much, much needed move towards IP version 6, and it's, it's happening whether people um, would like that or not. Uh, one of the things that RIPNCC is, 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 is going to be implementing, and, and we're talking with, and the community is actually talking about how to get this done, is a waiting list for people that say, oh, but we were not aware. Well, we're here talking about this for people to be aware, but also for those that put in requests how they can actually get that done. Because, again, in that bag of chips analogy, if we're still giving out those slash 22s, once we do not have a continuous slash 22 to give, that's when we say we completely run out. But then we're going to try to get uh, bits and pieces together, which just uh, to give out that space, which just makes it more harder for routing and, and other bits as well. So yeah, these are the policy discussions that I was mentioning. Some of them are talking about uh, reducing the, the, uh, the uh, current distribution into a slash uh, 24, like I was saying. Um, but then something else is happening that, that needs to be highlighted as well, which is transfers and hijacks. So what's actually happening? So does that mean the internet will stop running? No. There's a lot of transfers that we've been seeing going on, and uh, there's a lot of trading, whether for a fee or for free. But basically, if you look at the charts here over the, the, the period of time, you can see, so red indicates the number, uh, no, sorry, uh, red, the, the blue is number of transfers, and the red is the amount of space transferred. So you can see that there is a lot of transfers that are happening within the RIPE service region, which is Europe, uh, Middle East, and Central Asia. And uh, it, you can see a lot of space that is moving around uh, for that people that had a little bit more resources to actually transfer them, whether, like I said, for a fee or not. And this is also what's prolonging the existence of IP version 4 a little bit more. This is why you've been hearing about it for so long. And this is an interesting map, actually, because there are three out of the five RIRs that uh, have an inter-RIR transfer policy. And this map kind of quantifies the amount of space that has been transferred between those three. So AFRINIC, the RIR for Africa, and LACNIC, the RIR for Latin America and Caribbean, they do not do inter-RIR transfers. But ERIN for North America, RIPE NCC, and Asia Pacific, uh, APNIC, uh, they do. And you can see there's a lot of resources that are leaving uh, the ERIN RIR, moving into uh, RIPE, and moving into APNIC, um, which means that there's a lot more need for registering the resources because you do not want to be using resources that are registered in another country or another continent. So there's need to do that and, and make sure that all the resources are properly registered so that they actually indicate where the, the, uh, the, uh, the resources are actually allocated, uh, which ties back into stuff like law enforcement agencies and, and, and certs and, and even the running of the, the technical running of the, uh, the internet and how it would actually identify how to push traffic and, and packets back and forth. Um, but we've also seen a lot more disputes over IP, and hi uh, IP addresses and hijacks happening. Uh, people that do not keep their resources up to date, their contact information up to date, uh, resources that have been left dormant for a long time. We have seen people trying to hijack them, use them, because it's become such a, a valuable commodity now, and which has led the NCC to end up doing a lot more due diligence, whether when we're giving out resources uh, or when we 
we're, when we're following up and seeing are these resources actually being used, are they in place, uh, are, they, uh, are they being used by the people that say they are using it, uh, are the contact information more in place. So if you've been hearing more from the NCC uh, and at, we're asking you these questions, we're actually doing them for the benefit of the internet and you before anybody else. Um, uh, yes, uh, there is a lot of uh, yes uh, criminal activity, the, uh, faking registration, faking stuff, which has led the NCC to actually even shut down some of the membership uh, that have applied because we have seen people that are stockpiling on these resources now because they see the value. Um, I think last year the um, the average uh, market price for price for an IP address was around ten dollars. I've heard that number went up, and again, it depends on how big the block is or not. So you can imagine people that are trying to take advantage of uh, the low membership fee that the IPNCC would have and try to stockpile on some resources in a in an hope that they can actually end up selling them and making a lot of money after that. Um, and yes, this, this uh, like I said, what this means for us is the transfer market actually makes it more and more important for the registry bit, which is what we do. Uh, but we also do a lot of other stuff, as you heard, K-Root and the measurements and all the other bits. But for the registry function that the IPNCC uh, maintains, um, the, the, the registration is really important and really key moving forward. Uh, which means we are not going away anytime soon, even with IP version 4 running out. And yeah, there's this thing called IP version 6 that you can get from us as well. Um, it also impacts the dynamic that we have. Like I said, a lot more due diligence is being done. New services are probably required. Uh, we're looking into hijacks a lot closer. We're looking into uh, falsified documentation, which is something that we would not probably um, be facing as many of uh, in years before, but now we are. Uh, and we have people working on, on perfecting this uh, with the community. Um, and yes, and we need to, uh, to find that balance moving forward, which is also why we look at the community, which guides us on how we actually do these things. Um, and that, yeah, I hope you heard something new about this. Thank you. Thank you, Hisham. A very interesting presentation. Any questions for Hisham about the IPv4 runout or any other question that you might have for him? Or is it a bit too technical? So, okay, let, maybe I can ask you something. Um, what's, what sort of options uh, does a new um, ISP have? Let's say a new entrant wants to, to start their business. After the run out, what sort of options do they have? Well, so if you are starting f when you don't have any resources whatsoever, right? You can Nothing. still apply till, based on projections, uh, projections till February next year. It may end up. We, we've seen with uh, with uh, final slash eight, uh, there's usually like a gold rush towards the end. So that pr those predictions are usually, you know, a lot shorter than than you initially would think based on on historical uh, information. So, but you can now apply and get your resources. Now, if you need more resources, there's a transfer market, like I said. Uh, but that usually comes with a fee, so you end up paying a lot of money to do so, uh, which adds a burden to your operation. This is if you want to continue doing IP version 4. Uh, in Europe, there is, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, recommendations that came out of uh, Europol uh, on the amount of uh, NAT that can be used, how many users can actually be behind a nat solution, which is basically uh, trying to cluster more and more users behind one single IP address. And that goes back to stuff like you were hearing earlier about who's using the resources and how and, and where is that information stored and so on and so forth. So there are uh, some frameworks and guidelines about that that number should not go up. Now, not even, uh, we, we've seen in practice it goes up to hundreds and maybe thousands, but in Europe now the recommendations are less than 16 uh, per IP address. This is all about IP version 4. However, the, the best way of doing this, the best way of moving forward is actually doing IP version 6. And according to the CDNs uh, who you talk to, uh, more than 26% of traffic today is over IP version 6 that they deliver. This is Facebook and YouTube and stuff, so you would find something like that.
Dushan, you want to say something? Uh, um, I was um, trying to uh, imagine uh, uh, the world uh, where we are all on IPv6, what we are doing with IPv4? This is a question for you. Well, so so what a lot of people have expected. Well, here's the thing, and, and this is actually a, a question that came out of the um, the school yesterday, the, the, the discussions yesterday, is uh, because somebody was trying to tie back uh, GTP per, uh, in a country to uh, IP version 6 deployment or not. The thing is that there, there are a few elements of deploying IP version or keeping IP version 6 from being deployed. One of them may be that financial aspect, right? So a lot of people are saying to your point that uh, people are going to continue to run IP version 4 as long as they consider the cost of running IP version 4 is still less than doing IP version 6. So I'll give you a random example. Yemen, a country that has war and, and, and is, is no place to be spending thousands of dollars on, on, on technology at this point, have recently purchased for, I would say, around 700,000 euros IP version for addresses in a time where they cannot spare any extra euros. Uh, at one point, it will be really, really expensive to continue to run IP version 4. Um, and I think that would be the economical breaking point. Um, Another reason why IP version 6 is, is still not there is, and I mentioned this yesterday, people are still very uh, into what they're familiar with and what they've been using for the past 30 years. But to your question, what will happen? It will continue, I think the market for IP version 4 addresses will continue to go up, up until a point, that tipping point where it just, IP version 6 is easier and then it will not be worth anything. Uh, we have a question at the back of the room. Hello, it's Harris. So I want to ask if ISPs can trade IP before addresses between them, and maybe a black market of IP before will be created in the future. Yeah. Well, so there. Yes. There. you may end up giving one of your customers resources uh, or uh, for uh, w without uh, charging them anything because of an agreement you two have. Or maybe in one case, an operator would uh, send them whether to another operator in the country or out of the country for a fee, uh, thinking they can make a lot more money now off of selling the addresses rather than running operations. And we've seen this in many countries. Thank you. Yeah, uh, there's here. a question over there. Gargana, your question got the questions rolling. Sorry? Your question got the other questions rolling. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, Comparing to IPv6, IPv4 is going to be end. It will be a deadline for that. So are we going to stop the internet growing in all the world? No, okay, so... Finishing uh, with IPv4. Yeah, I mean. yeah. So there is no more IP version 4 to be distributed from the RIPE NCC. That doesn't mean that it will be, there is a cutoff date to IP version 4 running online. Uh, and uh, we, what we have been witnessing and we're currently living in is that transition period where there's both IP version 4 and IP version 6 out there. Uh, there are some that prefer using, uh, I, well, so if you look at uh, maps that are produced by the major CDNs, for example, Google, uh, uh, to, to mention one, but there's also Facebook and others. You would see that uh, the countries that have like the, the most uptake in IP version 6 are countries like the US and, and maybe India and Belgium, countries that do IP version 6 for mobile operators, because everybody now has a mobile device that wants to connect. So to keep up with that, especially with the always on technology, especially with 5G, and I think we have a session about that coming up, with the, all the, I don't want to say IoT, because not all IoT uses, uh, IP addresses, but with these devices that want to connect directly to the internet, they all require IP addresses. So the more that demand starts growing, the more IP, ver IP version 4, we know how many 
IPv addresses are out there, and again, they're, they're, most of them are, are, are allocated at this point. So while we may not have resources to give you in a year time, if you come to the right NCC and ask for IP version 4, you can still use the market, for example, and get resources from somebody else. But then, like I kept on saying, it will come with a cost. And at one point, you may say, wait a second, the cost of me doing business on IP version 4 is much, much higher for me as an industry than it is for me to do it on IP version 6. I'm just going to transfer. And this is why I gave the example of Yemen that have paid a huge amount of money when they cannot afford doing so. I highly doubt they're going to do this again. I guess the next time that they need resources, they're going to, and, and I know for a fact that they're working on this, the next time they need resources, they're going to be doing this over IP version 6 and not, uh, not depending solely on IP version 4. But is there a cutoff date for IP version 4? There is none, and I, I would challenge anybody that would say at this date IP version 4 will be cut off. Yes, I saw in a slide of your presentation that you have a possibility to get some IPs from Afrinic, maybe? So, so each one of the RIRs, actually, so actually Afrinec, they've also hit final sl uh, slash eight as well. And Afrinec actually has uh, policies set by their community that limit the resources that can be used out of the region as well. So unless you're actually building networks in Africa and using the resources in Africa, you cannot get resources from them. So, Thank you. yeah. And again, that's just prolonging the inevitable, right? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. Thank you. Any more questions? Last chance. Otherwise, I'm going. Thank you, Hisham. I'm going to move to our final presentation from Dushan today. Where is the clicker? Clicker. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, hi. Uh, I will be short, sweet and short, because I, I was. Uh, uh, expecting so much governmental people here, so and uh, I prepared a uh, very governmental oriented uh, presentation uh, in front of uh, Serbian Open Exchange. So uh, I will not talk about uh, high level technic stuff, I will talk about something which we need all to change and uh, uh, through the lens of IXP. Uh, so, firstly, why uh, it's written on the uh, first slide, adapt and adopt. Uh, this is what I was. I will try to explain. Uh, so, uh, back in the days, um, the uh, internet was very peaceful uh, place, uh, very quiet between engineers and academia people, and we were all friends without n criminals uh, or some s such activities that we know. Uh, so it was long, long time ago in a galaxy uh, very near, uh, so not far away. Uh, and uh, it ended. Uh, this story was ending today we have a uh, very different internet with a lot of crime with a lot of things happening on the on the internet a lot a lot of fake news i will not kill the panda etc etc so uh, basically uh, what we need to do now so do we need to say that uh, what we know from nature, the, the strongest survives, so we need to get stronger, we need to be fittest. Uh, or should we uh, do uh, what uh, Sox is suggesting to adapt to the reality which we have now on internet? So uh, basically, uh, we have uh, a lot of examples of bad or good behavior in in uh, in the world. So we heard about Russian uh, legislation. Uh, we uh, know about great firewall of China. Uh, we know a lot of these things. So uh, it's uh, the world of uh, gray-haired men like me is ended 
So there is no friends anymore. There is about politics. We need to switch our uh, uh, paradigm, our view on internet on something else. So our IXP is changing uh, this in a very different manner. So uh, instead of installing uh, huge servers, uh, root servers or something like that, uh, we switch uh, our way of thinking into how to uh, develop something for the user, to listen to the user and to listen what he needs. So there, uh, the internet is not giving uh, money as it was previously. So we don't have that much money on the internet these days. So we need to adapt, to adapt uh, to this reality, to listen to the user and to listen to what he needs. Also, we need to adopt uh, certain things that are coming with technological breakthrough. So, uh, yes, uh, we, we uh, have a lot of uh, things that we are doing uh, in SOX, uh, as uh, earlier uh, was mentioned, uh, but uh, we are definitely trying not to produce uh, the company as uh, as such as uh, the biggest something like that we need to have uh, a company which is uh, uh, building something uh, which uh, we promote as you see uh, promote uh, uh, um, uh, as a um, uh, something, something that is uh, user-oriented and expert-oriented uh, company. It's something that is uh, very new for us. Uh, this is our logo in the company and it's about communication, collaboration and cooperation and we repeat that on every each event that we go so uh, and I it's the essence of uh, the uh, practice that we have and uh, what I am uh, now talking about uh, I will shortly uh, just mention uh, about RS, uh, RS NOG uh, which is another NOG uh, uh, in uh, uh, next country to Romania, not Ronog, but Eresnog. So uh, we uh, have version 5, which will be held uh, um, uh, this year. Uh, so each year uh, we have uh, different, uh, different types of activities on uh, Eresnog, and we have uh, yearly around 200. Uh, participants uh, and a lot of pre uh, presentators uh, on on the event itself. Uh, so, uh, what are the next steps for everybody, including IXPs, uh, to survive the change, to make new friends, and to join forces with all of you? Unfortunately, governmental people are not here, so we cannot join forces with them, but next time we will catch them. That's from me, short and sweet. Thank you very much, Dushan. I see already one question from the audience. Hello, uh, Dushan, would you please tell me what were the specific problems you wanted to address to the government uh, sector? Uh, because uh, we uh, meet quite often with them and um, uh, it's one of our main purposes, I mean the association of ISPs, so uh, we might uh, attack such uh, topics as well, if of interest. And I, I assume uh, the problems you are facing in, in uh, Serbia are quite the same with the problems we are facing here, so please uh, let's communicate uh, on and cooperate and 
collaborate on this one. Uh, let's agree that they are not the same, but similar. So, uh, uh, yes, and there is a lot of problems. Uh, so we spoke a little bit about, about them uh, uh, during uh, this uh, session. Uh, so I will not repeat that we have uh, our own problems wi with the government. We spoke about, uh, for example, uh, critical infrastructure. Uh, you have, uh, you are a member of uh, European Union and uh, you have NIS uh, directive which uh, says and use different term which is uh, essential services if I remember cor correctly. So uh, we have, uh, for example, for, uh, just for this, uh, uh, we are critical uh, infrastructure in Serbia, the same as uh, Mikhail was, uh, was saying. Uh, so we we are the company that uh, was uh, elected to be uh, critical uh, in 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 a sense of of, of the uh, the the law that we need to address uh, uh, locally in Serbia is giving uh, it was a. a uh, copy paste from NIS directive, but in a bad sense. So, so it it has some uh, holes, and we are in the region where people are uh, good in finding holes in 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 uh, the laws. So yes, uh, so uh, so basically there is a lot that we need to talk with the government, and uh, that's the the the. The thing on the other side, I want to. Uh, um, I just forgot to to mention to Mikhail, when you are elected as critical uh, or essential services, critical infrastructure or essential services, you have a lot of things to do with PR about that. Thank you. Do you maybe want to share with us what sort of uh, things you discuss with governments? Oh, well, a lot, a lot, because um, our government is very creative, uh, <laughs> in so we have a lot of uh, changes in in the law coming uh, on a very short term or without a short term. Normally, there should be a period of um, communication between the government and uh, the industry, but sometimes uh, this uh, this period of um, uh, consultation is uh, is uh, lacking, or uh, uh, even the government uh, pretends to be doing it, but it's actually they are just uh, uh, waiting for the comments, our comments, but they, then they are ignoring them. You know, just uh, not to be accused, they they weren't open, but they are not. So uh, uh, from time to time, we face such um, phenomena that are uh, that are. Uh, overwhelming the industry that are are uh, uh, shaking uh, the business plans because um, changes in uh, in taxation or other rules uh, I, I mentioned taxation because this was the uh, the last such uh, unpleasant surprise that we we faced uh, in December last year but um, uh, there are other um, issues uh, that uh, are coming uh, year after year, uh, including those uh, mentions uh, mentioned by by Dushan earlier. Access to infrastructure again, uh, uh, it was a European directive of um, 2014, uh, which was uh, implemented quite with a quite big delay in, in Romania, and then um, we started to see the effects just just now, just uh, this year. And, and so on and uh, being a member of a member of EU has advantages and uh, I hope um, you guys in in Serbia will will enjoy the advantages as soon as possible too so why did you ask me about the governments in the first place uh, I, I mentioned I mentioned just rhetorical. a couple. Oh, rhetorical okay. <laughs> all right uh, thank you very much for the question, guys. I'm getting signals from the organizers that it's time for a coffee break. Um, we covered quite a lot of things in the technical sessions. We heard from IXPs, uh, CCTLDs, um, ICANN, RIPE NCC, and also SOX. And we heard about two different uh, network, um, uh, network operator groups from Romania and uh, from Serbia. Um, the presenters are going to stay here today and tomorrow, so if you have any more questions for them, don't hesitate to talk to them in the coffee breaks. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you.